Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And rare is the morning when you really don't know where to start with a story. I, I, I've been reading now for two or three days the Times newspaper's reports into Oxfam, um, previously a name, a word that was almost synonymous with the good side of charity. And, and now will forever be associated with tales of prostitution in disaster zones undertaken by people paid to bring help and support to those people. I, you can tell from my voice, it is, it, it, you struggle sometimes to, to even credit the callousness of your fellow man. Of course, what you have to remember twofold is, or at least what you have to ask, should this appalling behaviour by a minority of people associated with the organisation tar the whole outfit? And I'm going to tell you straight that at five after ten on this particular Monday morning, I find it very hard to un to disassociate, to, to untangle the people, the culprits apparently responsible for these disgusting acts, these disgusting stories, and, and the whole outfit. But that's completely wrong, isn't it? It would be as daft as thinking that Jimmy Savile was somehow representative of everybody that works at the BBC, or that um, well, there's some live court cases unfolding at the moment now, but you don't necessarily take down an entire outfit because of bad apples or bad eggs. But I don't really know how next time my bank statement comes round, and, and I'm not, what do they call it, the people who don't believe that anyone can be decent or at least try to be a better, that's it, virtue signalling. I'm not virtue signalling. Um, I, I do have a, a direct debit with Oxfam and a couple of other charities. It's, it's, it's usually private, but I'll make it public today. Oh, how, how are you going to see that on your bank statement against the backdrop of these stories? We didn't tell the government because... Our staff weren't guilty of exchanging sex for aid, the charity claimed last night. They were exchanging sex for money. That's such a, a wriggly response, isn't it, to the story? And there are sundry other elements to this tale you'll be aware of that add to the idea of institutionalised corruption. Um, it was in Haiti after an earthquake killed 220,000 people that Oxfam moved 230 staff into the ravaged country. And the following year, whistleblower claimed um, aid workers were using prostitutes, some possibly underage. Later that year, a director, no less, was allowed to resign after admitting using Haitian prostitutes. Two other staff were allowed to resign. Four were sacked for gross misconduct. And the following year, the, the director got another job with action against hunger with positive references. Now, prostitution, I don't know whether it's legal or illegal here. Um, uh, it, in, in Haiti, it's, it's not the point for me. It's not a question of whether or not these men were breaking any laws. Obviously, if some of the some of these people were underage, the laws were being broken all over the shop. But I, I just don't buy it. It's nothing to do with prostitution. If Look, I think of the Nazi invasion of France, odd though it may sound, and some of the women who sold themselves to the invading soldiers would not have done so in any other circumstances. To, to, to describe sex work as a lifestyle choice is very occasionally defensible or justifiable. But if you're in a, if you're in a country where people have died in hundreds of thousands... And you're quite possibly facing starvation or, or, or you're not making choices in a free and open way. To, to claim, unless I've missed something here, to claim that they weren't exchanging sex for aid is so fundamentally rank that I can't quite believe Oxfam have attempted to offer it up as a defence. Now, I think we can all be united in our disgust at this story. The question is the response. There will be, no doubt, plenty of people trying to use it as a, as a, um, uh, a stick with which to beat the let's stop foreign aid drum. But I don't really see how, if these poor women have been exploited and to a, uh, not raped as such, but actually, no, if they're underage, they've been raped. If these poor women have been exploited 
and abused in this fashion, how the hell would it be a logical or a just response to claim that somehow stopping the flow of money from the richest countries in the world to the poorest would be a suitable reaction? Eight minutes after ten is the time. But I've got to tell you that as a taxpayer and as a donor to Oxfam, at the moment I want to turn the tap off. That's not right, is it? It just doesn't seem fair when you think about the people who this money is designed to help to tell them that we're not sending any more because they've been abused by some of the men running the charities set up to help them. Nine minutes after ten is the time. I think that's how we're going to do it. If I've got this wrong, it will emerge in the course of the next 50 minutes or so, and we will, um, without any shame or, 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 or hesitation, we'll change tack ever so slightly. But I just, I just presume that no one's going to try to defend this. I think we can just chalk up as a given the fact that some people will try to use it as, a, as an argument against the whole of foreign aid. And if you want to set aside those two very obvious positions and focus on something where we might actually make some sort of intellectual process or progress, um, then we have a question about what you're going to do. Would it be right or wrong at this point for individuals to stop their personal donations to Oxfam? Hear the numbers now, you will get through. 0345 609973. Because I've got a real head versus heart battle here. It, 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 you're talking about a relatively small number of relatively senior people in a charity, but you're fighting the suspicion that, as with other sex abuse scandals, this will turn out to have been endemic or institutional. And the idea that stopping your own small donation would in any way address the bigger issues or help the people who've essentially been doubly hurt here, hurt by the tragedy, hurt by the earthquake, and then hurt by the behaviour of aid workers being bussed in... Um, I remember 10,000 NGOs working in Haiti alone, so the number of people responsible for this behaviour will be a tiny proportion. But I just don't know that Oxfam can walk away from this scot-free. Uh, they were re-employed in the same sector. People who had resigned in disgrace got another job with another charity around another corner. It's 11 minutes after 10. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Just give me a call and, and tell me where you sit on this one. Is it daft to feel that your personal contributions to a charity that until relatively recently was a byword for all that is good about, I mean, Christian charity, let's, let's be honest. O Oxham, I think, was, was set up by a... Was it set up by a Church of England minister? Would it be silly at this point just to say, I'm not giving you any more money? I'm just, because most of us will have it on a monthly rotor, won't we? You don't, you don't, you, it just goes out of your account every month. If you've signed up with one of the chuggers in the street or if you've filled in a coupon in the back of a magazine or if you've just sought via your church to make a regular donation via direct debit, direct debit coupled with the, um, the, the, the tax declarations means that the charities often get more money They because it gets topped up by the government. Oh, man, I can't remember the last story that upset me as much as this one. I can't think of anything worse than turning up in, uh, in, in, in a part of the world that has just had an apocalyptic experience visited upon it, and the people paid to come and help are helping themselves sexually to some of the survivors. But I guess you have to count. It's what we always say on this programme, isn't it? You have to count the number of people responsible. Oh, some have behaved abominably. Um, heads have to roll, I feel. Whose heads, I don't know, because a lot of the worst offences are now six, seven years old. A lot of personnel would have moved on. The fellow who runs Oxfam is not, I don't think, among the most lavishly rewarded. I do struggle sometimes to understand the rationale behind quarter of a million pound salaries for jobs that I've always presumed people do somehow out of the goodness of their heart rather than out of the solely materialistic pursuits that the rest of the world follows on. 0345 606 Coming up later in the programme, I'm going to look at this question of Aldi overtaking Waitrose as the nation's favourite supermarket. Just to remind mind you that there is some light relief around the corner and um, I, I wonder whether it speaks of one of my developing theories about the decline of the middle classes the middle classes in this country slowly disappearing to be replaced with a tiny tiny owning class and then the rest of us um, we'll get stuck into that and also we probably will return to the question of why 
having somebody like me in attendance would improve the quality of a young Labour conference designed to address equalities, um, given that white middle class, middle aged men enjoy more privilege than anybody else on the planet. Is there a case for suggesting that we should be excluded from conferences designed to advance the equalities agenda of people on the on the wrong end of uh, this country's privilege heritage? But that's all to come. We're beginning with Oxfam um, and we're looking at the question of how you can respond because I think it would be silly, perhaps, to cancel my personal direct debit, but I don't know that at this point in time I, I, I won't. I think I probably will. I don't see how I can watch that money fly out of my bank account at the end of the month without knowing more about how the hell they've ended up in this sort of mess. There's also the, the common ground thing as well, isn't there? The common ground idea that you've got to recognise the behaviours regardless of who's undertaking it. So this kind of endemic institutional sex abuse, just because it's being done by people who've been historically perceived as being on the side of the angels, um, you have to treat it identically. The same with the Mail on Sunday splash yesterday. Jo Joe Cox's widower, Brendan Cox, accused of highly inappropriate behaviour a few years ago when he was working for a charity. You, 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 just because the man has suffered in a way that you wouldn't wish upon your worst enemy doesn't mean you can look away from this kind of behaviour. That's the stuff that Donald Trump fans do. So desperate to keep their man um, uh, inflated that they ignore all sorts of vile allegations and accusations because I don't really understand why the, the political reward is so great. So all of this stuff is about recognising the, the commonality of behaviour, the exploitation, the abuse, the misogyny, whether it's been undertaken by Oxfam or whether it's being undertaken by the President of the United States of America. It's, it's, it's the same and you have to treat it the same otherwise we'll end up as mad as they are. But on this one, Sorry for making it so sort of personal, but a lot of people make donations to this charity as well. Question to you is, is it stupid to suggest that we should all cancel our direct debits? Is it worse than stupid? Is it dangerous? Does it actually mean that all the good work done by Oxfam would be compromised because of the behaviour of some scumbags who've already been handed their sandwiches wrapped in a roadmap? But I hate feeling powerless. I also hate feeling like a mug. I hate feeling that some of the tiny amount of money I've given to this charity over the years has made its way into the pocket of Roland van Halvermeeren, who resigned in disgrace and then a year later or got a job with another charity in, in other horribly blighted parts of the world. And is it, is it a hysterical overreaction? I think it might be, but I can't help it sometimes. I, I, here you go, this is Louise in Kingston. I volunteer with Oxfam every year at Glastonbury. I'm not sure how I feel about it this year. I've been doing it for over a decade, but I'm not sure I can see the senior team in the same light. What will the festival organisers do, I wonder? Well, I don't know if you go to church, Louise. If you do, and you put money in the collection plate, arguably you're giving money to an institution that has also engaged in a, in a cover-up that frankly dwarfs anything undertaken by Oxfam. The Catholic Church, in my case, I still put money in the, in the pot and defence of paedophile priests went all the way to the Vatican. The Church of England is set in the next three weeks to hear a catalogue of allegation and accusation as part of the child sexual abuse, the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse. It, it's going to be horrible, but the Oxfam story has, has focused our attention for the time being and posed similar questions. I, I just don't know, actually. 21 after 10. Martin's in Wimbledon. Martin, what do you think? Uh, well, let me tell you my background. I'm a counsellor and a therapist, and I've been seeing people from charities for 15, 20 years. Um, and obviously I only see the people who are, who are struggling, having a hard time. The people who are happy to come and see their counsellor. Do, do, do you mean people that have done charity work and, and been traumatised by some no, of the things... Know, no, I'm talking about people who actually work for counselling organisations. I won't name them because it's not allowed to. OK. And this doesn't particularly surprise me what we've heard of. It seems to me that so many more charities these are run by people as businesses rather than as charities. And so when I was hearing the direct, one of the directors defending Oxfam on, on, the, on BBC this morning, he sounded like he was, you know, he's being a businessman, being, you know, rather than the person who... He didn't seem to get it, frankly. That the, well, that's why I find the I find the parallels with the churches possibly more pertinent because I mean, you, you, would you claim that the Church of England was being run by, like a business when they cover up well, paedophile well, priests? Mr. I think Mr. Welby sounds more more like a business way, Archbishop Welby to me, but that's my my personal opinion. Okay, and they are wrong. But what I'm saying, the charity workers 
99 percent most of the people i meet want to do a good job yes and sometimes they're, they're, the institution gets in the way frankly like, like any other s- small organization there's you know politics and infighting and so forth and that's it but sometimes it's and it's pretty difficult when you're working for an organization like Oxfam or any, tra- in any tragic situation, it affects the people working there. I mean, it's very, very difficult. Well, this is the and chicken and egg, isn't it? I mean, I, I can't really imagine any situation so traumatic that I'd like to attend a Caligula-style orgy with people whose houses have just been destroyed in a volcano and some of whom may possibly yeah. be underage. But equally, we know well, that, mine, that, that this line of, line of work might attract people who have fairly grim appetites. I think, yeah, well, it took away that for a long time. What I, what I do think is that the, the only way XRAM is now, can now go forward and get people like you and me to keep, keep paying to them is, is to change, get somebody in who is a charity-based rather than business-based running it. Who wants to, you know, yeah, but then you rely entirely upon volunteers, and and um, you you know there'll be some levels of expertise here, doctors, for example, and other, and just the organisational skills you'd need on the ground. I I don't know that the answer is to stop paying people to undertake desperately important work and hope that you can round up enough volunteers. You'd be confining yourself to people with a private income. But I, as I say, I haven't got any better answers at the moment. Hopefully by eleven o'clock. We will have. Um, D- Diffid was told, apparently, but not the full details. Um, that appears pretty slim. Uh, also, Oxfam are expected to pass details to the police who have the power to prosecute UK nationals for offences committed overseas. And the charity has confirmed after these relevations, revelations came out um, they have got worries about recruitment and vetting of staff. It just doesn't really sound good enough. 0345 6060973 is the number you need. My uh, my pocket calculator and serial contributor to the programme, Incorrigible FCA, gives me pause with, with a characteristically thoughtful contribution. He suggests that this is a hysterical overreaction. I kind of... I kind of know he's right, but it's that fault of the money. When you see that money on your bank balance making its way from your hard-earned toil into the coffers of a charity that has presided over this, I think it's. I think you're going to struggle with that. But would it be stupid to stop? The people like me who work in Oxfam shops every day, day in, day out, volunteering, James, are gutted. Give me a call. I bet you are. Um, that's unsigned, that text. 25 after 10. Maggie's in Cobb. Maggie, what would you like to say? Um, oh, hello, James. Hello, um, Maggie. I, it's quite... Well, for me personally, it's very simple. I'm not very well off. Mm. But I give to three charities. The measure that I use to decide is, do I believe in the cause? Do I think it's well run? So I look at how, what their admin fees are. Yes. And can I afford it? So, having decided that I wanted to give to Oxfam, I went through that process of thinking, yes. and I give £40 a month. Now... I work hard for the little bit of money I've got. Mm. I'm not going to continue until I see evidence that, one, that they are going to bring in policies and procedures that safeguard this from happening again. And two, that they have done an open and honest investigation which they've revealed to all the people that contribute and make their work possible. That's as simple as that. So you're going to put it on hold until until they address your hold. concerns? Yeah, exactly. I'll put it on hold. I'll probably pick up another charity with that £40 while I'm waiting. Good for you. Um, and, and then I will restart it if I feel it's worth my money. And I mean, it is, it's seven years ago. That, that there's, I mean, no suggestion yet of anything similar occurring subsequently. The, the, the man at the centre of it, this um, van... How Vermeeren character uh, left the charity. I think we'd all agree he should never have been employed in the sector again, let alone just the following year with positive references. They can learn from that. And the yeah, and, and the current. Go on. But, yeah, the, the problem the problem with that is you know thinking that way, and it is a fair way to think. Mm. Is that you and I don't really know. No. We don't really know. But we're snowflakes. We're, we're, we're letting our lack of yeah. knowledge prevent us from arriving at a strong conclusion. What you're supposed to do is get the barest minimum and then start screaming from the rooftops about how this proves all charities and all foreign aid is wrong and we should stop it all immediately. Yeah. I, I, I just think I've got, to, I've got to get to a position in my mind 
where I feel is a charity worth my time. I like you, Maggie. I like you a lot. Can I ask what that position would look like? Uh, it would look like me reading, seeing and feeling that they are making an effort. So they need to send us, or you, um, I'll yeah. stop using myself as an example because now I can use yeah. you, Maggie. So they need to send you a, 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 a really full, frank and compelling account of how this happened and why and how you can be confident that it won't happen again. You got it. Yeah. You got it. But, how, I mean, but what about the thought that in the meantime... The, the work that Oxfam does could be comprom <laughs> excuse me could be yeah. compromised by the um, removal of your moolah. And that makes me very sad. But I'm not going to feel guilty about that. The people that have done this should feel guilty. I like you even more. That's a brilliant answer. Yes, I, I, and uh, of course, I think you're perfectly entitled to wait for that account, to wait for that explanation. It needs to be forthcoming. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. But then the pendulum once again. As Gary Burton predicted, this would be what we call a pendulum hour on the programme, because as soon as I say goodbye to Maggie, having covered her in compliments, I read Dominic's tweet to at Mr James O'B that says, I've never been a fan of making the whole school suffer for the behaviour of one or two, and it does feel a little bit like that. But I, I thought Maggie provided a third way. She was like, I, I, I will temporarily suspend my donations, but I will resume them as soon as I have been reassured and made confident that this is, if not a one-off, which would be the sort of ideal conclusion, then something that they are moving very fast and very robustly to prevent from ever happening again. Um, what's astonishing is that a lot of these people that moved on, including most obviously this Van Halvermeeren Van Halvermeeren character, moved on to other positions with other charities with positive recommendations and references from Oxfam. But I have to tell you that quite a lot of organisations do this, you know, when, when you, you, you kind of manage it as a little local difficulty. Part of the deal is if you fall on your sword, if you walk away, um, then we'll not hinder your chances of getting work elsewhere. It's a horrible trade-off, but it's not confined to the charity sector and it's certainly not confined to Oxfam. Just try this on for size. Um, I've got a couple of phone lines free, by the way, if you want to give me a ring and, and talk me through your relationship with Oxfam. But has there ever been any institution, whether big or small, that responds to these sort of situations in the way that we all, on the outside, feel that they should? You know, the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse is, is, is unfolding. That, that sees almost countless institutions that have covered up allegations of sexual impropriety or worse to protect themselves. So at school, not with the two men that ended up in prison for their crimes, but, but I mean, I got beaten up by a teacher when I was 12 and the headmaster was desperate because Dad was a journalist desperate not to put it in the, not 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 to let it get out of the school because it would have affected the business model people would have stopped sending their children and, and getting paid fees so the teacher disappeared that night it was never heard from again um uh, the headmaster kind of rolled out the red carpet for mum and dad and told them it would be awful for me to arrive at my next school known as the boy who'd you know been in the newspapers and been to court with the and looking back um, we probably should have done more, but mum and dad were desperate to protect me from being in the witness box. And this was just for being beaten up, remember? This wasn't sexual abuse. Uh, uh, and that, that's how it happens. And then my big school um, has had similar scandals, which appear to me and a lot of my ex-school friends to have been covered up by the, by the monks that ran the school which I attended because they're desperate to protect... It's about how important you think these offences are and historically... I mean, if we weren't treating child sex abuse as important, you, I'm not going to play that clip again from the Tory whip talking about scandals involving small boys being used to exert pressure. They'd help the MPs involved cover them up and then exert pressure on them subsequently to do the whip's bidding. That's on the record, for heaven's sake. Um, but you, you, if we lived in a world within living memory where raping small boys wasn't considered to be something you should blow the whistle on as a member of the Conservative Party's whips office, then it's hardly that surprising that we still live in a world where perhaps having a senior colleague who was using prostitutes after arriving in Haiti to deal with the aftermath of that dreadful earthquake would raise eyebrows but not raise alarms.
It's gross, but it, it is so important. And this is my new hobby horse, I think, moving forward. It's so important not to let the identity of the culprit influence your attitude to the behaviour. So, uh, sort of, if you will, you, you, you people who are apologists for Donald Trump self-confessed sex offending and indeed his defense of, a, of an alleged serial wife beater over the weekend they have to be like that because the alternative is too horrible for them to contemplate people on the right side of history have to be just as down on the same behaviors even when they're undertaken by people that seem to be made of a different metal you have to come down on it just as hard otherwise you become the enemy otherwise you become just as hypocritical and just as corrupted as people who find themselves defending self-confessed sex offenders because they like some elements of their racist politics this is awful this story but how do normal people respond to it how would it help victims of the next earthquake for you and me to stop giving money to oxfam which is the priority of anyone who gives to charity. I, I don't know. Henry is in Kingston. Henry, what would you like to say? Uh, good afternoon. Good, sorry, good morning. Good morning. Hello, Henry. Jumping ahead of myself. Don't worry. Uh, it's the afternoon somewhere. <laughs> so um, I, I was in Haiti um, a, a few weeks after the, the earthquake happened. Um, I was out there supporting the NGO and uh, UN functions uh, with a, a well-known manufacturer that supports these projects. Okay. Um, so I spent uh, three months in Old in Port-au-Prince uh, during the tragic events and uh, got first-hand experience of um, of how some of these organisations operate and how they uh, they we say put their feet up in 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 the evenings after um, after work. Yes. Um, <sighs> Eight, eight, eight weeks after being there, there was um, there was a, a bar that was opened. There was a bar that was opened in um, in Port-au-Prince, um, and um, this was. Are you all right? You sound a bit distracted. I can yeah, I can come back to you in a my, minute my, if you my, want. My, no, my, my son has just come back from the dentist, so um, I'm just escaping to another room. Okay. Well, hang on. Shouldn't um, you be checking that your boy's all right? No, but he's with his mum. He's oh. absolutely fine. All right, carry on. Um, <laughs> so, just checking. It's a caring radio for you, this. <laughs> <laughs> so there was, a, there was a bar that was opened in the evening, um, and uh, this is where a lot of the NGOs and the UNs used to congregate. Um, when we first arrived out into Haiti, we used to have uh, formal meetings with, uh, with, with, with certain NGOs and, then, um, and the UN authorities. Mm. Uh, which didn't sort of uh, get um, any success. So what we ended up doing was having to um, go to these bars late at night uh, to have more informal meetings, shall we say. Yes. Um, You're being quite cryptic. You don't need to be. I, I, forgive me if this is your normal manner, but I, I, I kind of sense that we're dancing around something that you're not, you're not sharing. There's no, there's no reason why you shouldn't hear, at least. Uh, I, I need to sort of protect myself a little bit because I'm still working within the, uh, the African uh, within the African continent. Um, okay. I'm now out of aid and development, so I need to sort of protect my uh, my own interest as well. Right. So, I mean, um, in a nutshell, what do you what did you ring in to tell me? In a nutshell, um, I saw first-hand experiences of uh, some of the allegations that were being made that are being made to Oxfam from um, from other uh, NGOs. Did you report them? I did not. I did Can I ask why not? And this isn't a criticism by any stretch of the imagination, because I did just spent three minutes waxing lyrical about how hard yeah. it is to properly blow the whistle on these kind of behaviours. So can I just ask why you didn't report them? Um, why did I not report them? Uh, good question. Um, That's what I'm here for. Yes. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I just went the other way and sort of... Um, I knew it was wrong. I, I went out the you, knew, you knew it was wrong? I knew it was wrong. I knew, uh, I knew are it was we wrong. talking about prostitution? We are talking about prostitution, yes, we are. And, and was there any way of establishing whether the women in these bars were... I, I Forgive me, but the word I'm going to use is desperate. Whether or not their prostitution was a result of their privation, was a, was a consequence of the earthquake, or whether or not they were sex workers before the uh, earthquake. The, inter the interesting thing is that... Um, and does that even matter? I, mean, I don't know anymore. <laughs> Uh, well, the interesting thing is, um, I was I was actually ch having a chat with the the, the the Irish guy that owned the this bar. Yeah. And, um, he used to recruit the girls in from um, neighbouring Dominican Republic. Oh, so it wasn't they weren't rendered but, prostitutes no. by their earthquake related poverty. No, they weren't. They were. Um, so, what would you have reported then in that case? What would I have reported? Um, and it's it's grim, but it's not necessarily 
I, I mean, what would the offence be? A consensual transaction, albeit something that offends my moral sensibilities. There are plenty of people whose moral sensibilities are gloriously unoffended by by prostitution of any kind. What, what, what would you have reported? Why do you sound as if you were so dismayed by this? Well, the, the, so my, my discussions here are just about yeah. what was happening in this, uh, yeah, this exactly. bar. But, but there were well, there were also other um, unauthorised transactions that used to happen outside of the bar. Uh, yeah, but we, we have to confine ourselves to the stuff you witnessed, don't we? Uh, yes, and there, were, there, there was stuff that was witnessed um, outside like of the what? bar. Like what? What sort of stuff? Again, I sense that you're... Um, I don't know why you're being coy. I want to hear it all, Henry, and then, then I get a better picture. Right, OK, so uh, one particular night, we were in a bar, um, in this said bar, um, coming out with um, a, a logistics manager from um, a selected NGO that yes. is a UK-based. Yes. Um, and um, we um, we were taking this guy back home, back to his offices, and um, and he picked up um, a local a local lady. Yes. Um, on, on the street. Um, just got back to his uh, apartment. Now she she might have the, been she might have been on the street street as a result of earthquake related privation. Uh, certainly, she certainly was. Yes. Yeah, that's just gross. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and you didn't report okay. that. It sounds like I'm having a go at you. I'm not. I I'm, I'm no. just keen to learn. I can't for a minute say that I I would definitely have done so either if if I was walking in your shoes. It was it was very difficult report because of the industry that I was in and because of the main yeah, of that I was representing, who um, who is very sort of a, very much associated with this market that we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, this is it, isn't it? This is this is where we see them all as really speaking to similar themes. It's not because I, I, I'm not here to criticise or condemn you. You've probably beaten yourself up a bit, have you? Afterwards. Uh, completely and utterly. I've, I've stepped out of the aid and development industry. Um, I've stepped away from um, from that particular market. Um, I, yeah. I don't give any any, any money. Um, my my, my mum works for a, a special needs school, and they had a fundraising a, um, event before I went out there. And they said, yes. "There you go. There's two hundred and fifty pounds. Give it to a local NGO." Yes. I come back with that two hundred and fifty pounds in my back pocket and oh, decided to wow. do it for a local company because I I didn't see any of the organisations out there fit enough to um, to use this money for. It was that. I mean, you, you, you didn't, so you wouldn't necessarily see these characters as bad apples. You'd see them as representative of the whole sector. Or well, bearing in mind that you were part, you, you were part of that sector, and presumably you don't see yourself as a bad apple. No, not at all. Not at all. Um, it, so you would advise, it, it, and you've been to Haiti. The massive majority of people listening to this program won't have been anywhere near it in the aftermath of that earthquake. You would, you would advise them all to stop giving money to to, to Oxfam, would you? Um, to Oxfam and to other, um, there's, there's other other NGOs out there that I did have a very sort of positive, positive sort of um, out, out uh, view on after meeting with them and seeing their work. Yes. But there were selected other NGOs and UN organisations that um, that I would I would never ever sort of associate myself with. I, or I get that. Give any of my hard earned money to. Yeah, and, and who can blame you having having witnessed that? Is it? Is it do you, I mean, just just out of interest, Henry, when, when I laboured that point about the question of the prostitute who is there, as you mentioned, from another country, who, who, who've... I mean, it's a gross... It's a gross imbalance of income that allows these situations to flourish, but they happen all over the world. It seems to me to be, from the point of view of a charity worker or an NGO worker, the offence of, as you said, picking up a woman who is clearly selling herself because she's in such dire straits post-earthquake seems to me to be a much, much graver offence than buying sexual services from one of the women in the club or the pub that you described. Does that tally with you, or, or, or does it make me sound a bit naive? Um, it, it does make you sound a little bit naive. Yeah. Um, I, I, I see that... Ev, ev, I, I still travel out to, um, to Africa quite regularly with my current work. Um, in fact, I was in Morocco... Um, uh, I got back from Morocco on Sunday yes. morning. And this is uh, something that isn't just confined to, to Haiti. It's something that's, that is confined, that, that is sort of quite uh, wide. Yeah, well, it will be, won't it? Because you've got a Western salary. You've got a first world salary in the pockets of people living in the third world. And the, and the commoditization of humans is, oh, I don't want to say an inevitable upshot of that, but grim, grim. Completely. And um, and, and that was that was how I saw, sort of saw... Um, saw Paula Prince. It was just, it was a massive market for people to make money and people, it was almost like, dare I say it, um, a party, a party atmosphere, almost. 
I, I think I understand that. I, and and I, the, the defence would be that you've seen such gross things during the day that you need to let your hair down on an, on a, on a, on an amplified level in the evening, but it doesn't excuse any of the things that we've heard. If you'd, if you'd blown the whistle on the bloke that you accompanied back to his office or his hotel room, um, I wonder whether you would have lost your own job. I don't know. And, and I've just glanced at the clock and we're very late. Henry, mate, thank you so much for that. I, I appreciate it was a little bit... Harry at the beginning, because the lad just arrived back from the dentist. I hope, I hope. Is he, are you still there, Henry? I'm still here. Well, th thank you so much, because, uh, you know, I often say that the callers with personal experience of these issues are worth more. I didn't think I'd get any today, so I, I owe you double, and I hope the boy's all right. Thank you very much. God bless, mate. It's a, a brief interlude for Brexit fans. A um, couple of very classy contributions to the debate today. The Finance Minister of Malta is on the record saying, we thought that 27 countries would be squabbling among themselves by now, but instead it is one country squabbling with itself. It is very strange. But this is probably my favourite. If you haven't seen Digby Jones's um, increasingly frenzied loss of grip on reality on social media this morning, it's worth a look. But this is my favourite. My granddad came home after a stroke with orders not to smoke. His wife called him. Have you been smoking? No. Why is your chair on fire? It was on fire when I sat in it. True story. We are now at the it was on fire when I sat in it stage of Brexit. Um, back to the Oxfam story and um, I thought Henry was a brilliant contributor because he, he reminded us that actually so I'm not judging you, I'm judging me. Would you be the one to compromise your own livelihood and career by blowing the whistle upon the behaviour of people, especially if they were senior to you? Because then you've got the Harvey Weinstein story, you've got the, um, the Bill O'Reilly at Fox News story, you've got um, various other uh, uh, accusations and allegations being made against people that everybody in the organisation must at least on some level have been aware of. And when you're on the outside looking in, you can get very sanctimonious, can't you? And say, well, that, why didn't they... But I understand why people don't. It's, 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 I, when I asked Henry whether he reported what he'd witnessed, I wasn't having a go at him. I was trying to shine a little bit of light into why these things don't happen. You've got no idea what it would be like to have spent your day working with earthquake victims in Haiti... But equally, uh, it seemed to me to be a pertinent distinction between sex workers who, rightly or wrongly, uh, you will find everywhere you go in the world, and people reduced to selling themselves by the circumstances of the tragedy, the disaster that the aid workers have gone to address. That's why I drew parallels with the... Nazi occupation of France. Um, maybe it was unjust. We'll find out. 10.54. Steve's embarking. Steve, what would you like to say? Yeah, morning, James. Um, I, I listened to that, Henry, and uh, I, I think people should just start growing up a little bit because let, let, let's, let's take my own situation. I don't want you to misquote me here. Let's take this Oxfam thing for a start. Yeah. If they're using children, then they should be prosecuted in this country for the sex tourism, and, 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 and I'll be the first to bang them up for 100 years. Yeah. But if they're in a war-torn country... And bearing in mind, when I left the army, I left the army in '93, and I got a job with the Overseas Development Administration with a woman called Linda Chalker. I don't know if ba ba Baroness Chalker, yeah, under her. Baroness so you were working for her organisation. I do remember that. I was working. I was working for the Overseas Development Administration. Yeah. And then they would farm you out to companies like or charities like Medical Sans uh International Red Cross. And I was working in Bosnia. Right. When the Yugoslav War was kept cracking on. Now, if you're in an area like that, and I was based in places like uh, Zagreb, Mekovic, uh, uh, Gornivaco, places like Zar um, Sarajevo, yes. where the locals would put furniture out in the street so they could walk up and down without the snipers knocking their head off, yeah. and that's no word of a lie. I know. If you're, you're working in places like that, uh, we used to get an allowance of 300 Deutschmarks a week, because it was Deutschmarks out there, not Euros. Yes. And... I, I've used prostitutes in that, in that and, and at the end of the day, they used to hang around the lobbies of the hotels. Now, I was single. They they were willing to do it. Who's, who, what right have you or that Henry to criticise people like me? Judge me what I do the next day when I deliver a thousand tonnes of grain or, or food to starving kids. And that woman who says that she works in the shop and she ain't going to put no more money in, into charities, well... When they used to go out to Africa, uh, to the Rwandan War and places like that, they, Medical Sans Frontier would deliver these little vials of, of, of eye drops 
and they would cost one pound twenty, and it would save a child's sight. So even if you put thirty quid into charity, even if five pound it fil- filters down to good causes, you're helping some poor little war-torn kid. So don't everyone get off their oils and and start growing up because at the end of the day, it's life. I, I can't. Um... I can't thank you enough for ringing in. And, and I, I was edging, I think, towards... I wouldn't have had the... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I think p- possibly the cajones, to put it quite as boldly as you have. And I, and I don't know that I would have behaved in the way that you did when I was there. But to, but to sit in the comfort of this studio and say that after a day's work in, in unbelievably awful circumstances, we're now going to tell you what you can and can't do with your own money, your own time, your own social life, and we're going to tell those women what they can do with their own, what they can and can't do with their own bodies. I see exactly where you're coming from, but do you understand why some people, and I'll put myself on this list, Steve, I won't lie to you, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with what you're saying. Well, James... For, 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 for one reason. Let me explain why, very briefly, and then I'll give you all the time you need. We'll, we'll hold the news, because um, obviously it's a remarkable contribution that you've made. If the, if the woman you were paying for sex was only selling sex because of the tragedy that you'd gone to Yugoslavia to alleviate, does that put a different complexion on things or not? No, and I'll tell you why. Go on. Some places like Srinibza and, 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 and um, Mekovic, places like that, or um, Mostar, yes. women out there were selling their... And I ain't made no bones about it. Uh, uh, they were adult women. Uh, get, don't get me wrong, children, you got to bang... You bang no, I hear, I hear the distinction. But, but I hear the distinction. Adult women were knocking on the sides of the cabs and for 40 fags, you could have sex with them. Now... If that makes their life a little bit more tolerable... Couldn't you give them the 40 like fags without having sex with them? I'm being a bit devil's well, advocate we, 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 did, we would do it. I'm not saying I did that for that, but what I'm saying, we used to pay them the witch marks, and it was a hard currency that they could they could keep their family going for months, literally months of food and, pl- uh, you know, and luxuries that we, we take every day for granted. Uh, James, I've seen, we used to get bowels of sweets mm. and fry them out the windows and the kids would run in the road. There was a kid who got killed by uh, Ch- uh, someone from UNHCR because he got run over. Chasing don't, sweets. Please don't judge me what I did on my time off with my own money. Judge me what I do when I went out there and I got the certificate from... Oh, this mate, I, I hear you. I really do. I, so you would say that these Oxfam people, if there were no children involved, you'd say there's no story here, would you? Oxfam said this morning, I listened on Radio 4, and yeah. Oxfam said this morning that there was no aid past hands. Now, that can mean medical supplies, that can mean clothing, that can mean money. Now, I believe that these people have used their own money, their weekly allowance that they get out in these places. You get an allowance so you can buy cigarettes, a little bit of booze, this, that, the other, because in your own time, you can't work 24 hours, you go off your rocker. I was in the Gulf War, and things I saw in Bosnia yeah. make the Gulf War look like a party. So you have to, you have to, you get this little bit of allowance, and at the time, I got 300 Deutsche Marks a week, and that was for your own personal use. No, now, and, and there's nothing to stop you spend, spending your wages on stuff as well. But, but, you, but, but, you, but you, you, James, and that Henry, you, you've turned your... You've looked down on me now like I'm some scumbag. And at the end of the day, it's not how it is. Life is not black and white. There's grey areas. Well, that's my motto, Steve, although I've got to tell you that, that, that you've sort of taken me to school today. I, I, the bit I struggle with... Is, is the bit I just described to you, is, but, but you're, you're very matter-of-fact about it. Here is a woman, she is selling herself. If I pay her for sex, and, and I suppose you could put on your little halo and say, why can't you just give them all the money anyway without having the sex with them? But I don't, I don't think anyone's quite that naive. If she's only selling herself because she's so desperate... It seems to me to put a different complexion on things, but your response is very hard to resist. You just say, well, that, that makes the money that you are giving her even more valuable, right? That's what you're saying. Well, if you give, if, if, if you was in Africa, say, and, and, and a woman came up and she wanted sex with an, with an egg worker, and he gave her $10, right? $10, that would feed her family for a month. A month. In fact, if other people saw that $10, they'd probably kill her to get the $10 off of her. 
So, honestly, these people... And, and to stop giving to charity, these places, like you say, yes. some of your money will filter down to, to, to the, on the people on the ground and little children will be... They'll be helped. So, so don't not give money because at the end of the day, that's, that's the worst thing to do. I, I, I don't know what to say to you. You've completely shaken up my whole attitude to this story, which, to be honest with you, Steve, was pretty shaken up already. I mean, the, the, the absence of certainties, as you say, the, the absence of black and white, except on the question of, of, of underage and on children where, where everyone can be in complete agreement. Your argument, if I want to get it absolutely right, is if people are offering uh, sex in return for currency to people who are in the area to do good, what business is it of yours whether those people, as long as they continue to do good, whether those people choose to take up that, that offer of sex for money. Well, thanks for letting me get my point across anyway. Well, I'm glad you have. I, 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 I'm pretty close to speechless, which is not ideal, because we've got two hours to go. And, um, that, that rather put a cat among the pigeons, didn't it? A, a call from, if you're just tuning in, a call from a former soldier who went to work for an NGO in the former Yugoslavia during the, the worst days of their civil war, and very unapologetically described how he would use some of his allowances per diem to pay prostitutes for sex, um, even in the knowledge or the suspicion that those women would not have been selling themselves in that way if they weren't in the circumstances that he was being paid to alleviate. And uh, I'd hope, I hope everyone's as sort of discombobulated by that as I am, because I, I, I still think it's wrong, but hearing Steve defend it you know the golden rule of this program is experience is worth a lot more than opinion. So I have never used a prostitute, but lots of people listening to this program have. And the question of why they have been prostitutes, why they have become prostitutes, will have an awful lot to do with their circumstances. And I don't know where the line is between um, circumstances that you think allow you to take advantage of prostitution and circumstances that you think should prevent you from taking advantage of prostitution. Do you see what I mean? So, I, I, I mean, a heroin addict who sells herself, is that okay? Because she wouldn't sell herself if she wasn't a heroin addict. Somebody in Haiti after the earthquake who sells herself because her house has been demolished and her children need feeding, she certainly wouldn't have sold herself prior to the earthquake. Yeah, but you're there to help people who've been in the earthquake. Well, I'm not not helping them. This is on top of my aid work. This is my extracurricular activity. She offers me sex for money. I give her money. She gives me sex. Look, I, I'm a massive um, result of my own upbringing, like the Catholic guilt that they did their best to inject into my bloodstream from the age of about three onwards and, and the sexual confusion that, um, that the Catholic Church indoctrinates men with, that the, the virgin whore problem is probably influencing me on this. I listened to Steve and part of me was nodding along and the other part of me was disgusted. I don't know which part of me is right. Like you, I'm rendered almost speechless by Steve James. I can't believe what I've just heard because I'm paid to do some good in my job. I can act immorally in every other way. Outrageous, says Laura in Blackheath. And yet, the one thing that I didn't think would happen during this first hour has happened. It's become a conversation about the rights and wrongs of prostitution. So you end up wondering, when is prostitution OK if you think that it's wrong in these situations? It's amazing what different people hear when they listen to the same programme. Ben's been in touch to say, he speaks the truth, James. You can't handle the truth. I, I presume you're referring to, to the same call. Um, Owen says, ex-squaddy relating his time in Bosnia is the best call I've heard to the show yet. Um, and... I go back to incorrigible FCA because he was fairly strident at the outset. Certainly the stories of NATO servicemen using prostitutes in Bosnia and Serbia at that time are plentiful. The sex industry was the only viable earning opportunity in that region for years. Uh, oh, man, this is, this is tough. So if, if you had to pick a side, pro-Steve or anti-Steve, I'd pick anti. But as he said himself, it's a hell of a lot greyer than perhaps our original analysis allowed. I'm going to do something we don't often do and take a few calls about a call, OK? And then we'll move on to something else, because I, I, I'm reeling from that very simple explanation of why it is 
unnecessary, silly, sanctimonious, judgmental, uh, naive, whatever it may be, to say to men who are in war zones or in disaster zones, they are fundamentally and always wrong when they pay women from that area for sex. I still think that it is always and fundamentally wrong, but maybe, maybe I'm not dealing with reality. Tracy's in Ealing. Tracy, what do you think? Oh, hi, James. Hello, uh, I'm sorry, I thought that was a bit depressing, actually. And um, It was real, I, though. And I know it's real. Yeah, I understand that. I just, you know, I just think, because when he was saying that, um, you know, they can take the money, and uh, I just think <sighs> my automatic feeling was, well, I'd just give him the money. Yes. I wouldn't ask for that in exchange. Well, I don't think I, I don't think I would either. But we've never been there. We don't know what it's like day in, I know, day out. I keep saying that. Yeah, I keep saying that to myself. <laughs> I, I think it doesn't make it right, though. It still doesn't make it right, even though I haven't been in that situation or they have been in that situation and they've done that. It doesn't make it right. But you would be opposed to prostitution in all circumstances, then, would you? Not necessarily. No. Well, if somebody then... really wanted to do it. Yeah, but then it depends on what's driving them to do it, doesn't it? And it's always going to be uh, financial considerations, almost always. Well, it might And you be could financial. always say to the person paying for sex, why don't you just give them the money without the sex? Not really, because some some people think they're doing do it as a service. It depends how desperate you are. If but how do you measure the desperation? Well, if you feel like you can't make money anywhere else, well, that's that's true of all prost or almost all prostitutes. Really? I presume so. I don't think so. I think some prostitutes do it because they uh, they're offering a service to somebody who might be lonely. Well, Steve would argue that the that the prostitutes in Bosnia were offering a service to people who were lonely. I don't know if that's true. Well, how can we know? Because they're well, in, you a, a, in a blatant situation that is... But look, with, 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 with the possible exceptions of, of, of you know, the, the, the kind of the trope of the high-class call girl, so leaving that aside, most women offering themselves for sex would presumably rather be paid the same amount of money for doing something else, don't you think? Or am I sounding all Catholic and, and messed up I now? I don't know, to be honest. No. It's never really... And I'm I, honestly, I'm not calling to say how dare he do this. Nor I'm am I. Calling, to, it's how I feel about it, really. Does it I put just, a different gloss on the story, the Oxfam story that we started discussing at ten o'clock this morning? It actually makes me feel worse about that story. To be Does honest, it? does it? Yeah, I think I've probably been quite naive about it all, and. Yeah, I just think... Ooh. Because instead of it seeming like an exceptional circumstance, it now sounds like business as usual, and all that's happened here Absolutely. is that the spotlight has been shone on Haiti, on Port-au-Prince post-2010, whereas this kind of thing is probably going on. And, and remember, Steve's ex-army, he's not hes not a lifelong charity worker, so... Yeah. Oh, I hate it when this happens. I've got no idea whether I'm coming or going now, Tracy. It's depressing, isn't it? It is depressing, but oh. then again, as I began your call by reminding you, it's, it, it's reality. I'm going to take a few more calls on this because it's, it's, it's... Well, I guess this is our own fault, isn't it, for not going down the lazy, isn't foreign aid awful, or would you like to slag off charities route? You start treating things and people uh, as intelligent and complicated and you end up perhaps becoming a, a victim of just how complicated it is. <sighs> Make you now less or more likely to cancel your direct debit to Oxfam. It seems like a stupid question against the backdrop of what's emerged since. Uh, it's coming out to quarter past 11. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. On a lighter note, later in the programme, we will be looking at the, uh, the, the, the toppling of Waitrose as the nation's favourite supermarket. And another, I would say, opportunity for um, enemies of the Labour Party to typify it as a relatively ludicrous movement in places. Um, this is a, a, a conference to which straight white men are barred. Um, they are prevented from entering. It is a conference about equality, and generally speaking, straight white men have got the best deal available in the Western world at the moment, but some people, of course, dispute that. We'll, we'll hopefully have time for both of those, but I do want to hear some more voices on this, not least because I'm so discombobulated myself. Oh, Steve was one of the most compelling callers that I think we've ever had on the programme, but, but whether or not 
talking about it for a little bit longer will lead us back to where we were before we heard from him and it will be uncomfortable listening for him if we conclude that he was an exploitative scumbag but right now i'm not comfortable I'm not comfortable drawing that conclusion. The, uh, <laughs> the, the gulf between people who listen to the same radio programme and arrive at such vastly different conclusions never ceases to fascinate me. Here's another one. Um, the same conversation, remember, that, that had an earlier contributor con concluding that we can't handle the truth. Now, apparently, O'Brien condones sex with victims because the charities are in line with his political views, speaks volumes about you, mate. I sometimes wonder whether there's someone doing an impression of me elsewhere on the radio dial, and you've accidentally tuned into that. Um, James is in Clapham. Back to that remarkable contribution from Steve, which um, I'm going to sort of praise as saying, an ex-soldier who used local prostitutes while working as an aid worker in the former Yugoslavia thinks that the Oxfam story that we've been discussing all morning is in large part a fuss about nothing. Your response to that, James? It's a fuss about nothing, James. It's an absolute disgrace. These people are sent there to help people that are in dire, dire need. And if I can just give you uh, an explanation. I served in Bosnia in 93. I was in Thomas Lavgraf. I was in Goni for Kuf, where Steve was. Yes. I was in I was in Tuzla. And um, what I had to do when I was on duty uh, at the UN camp, we used to have the local women that used to work inside there, you know, our cooks and our cleaners. Yes. And they were allowed to leave with barrels of potato skins. Yeah. yeah, and my job was to t was to go in like a Nazi concentration camp guard and put my hands into the barrels, yeah, to see if they were stealing anything. Now, when I put my hands in, I could see I could see they were stealing ham, cheese, coffee, and sugar. Now I let them pass. Well, what was I supposed to do? I asked them for sex. No, these people were in dire needs, James. Right, and they were stealing stuff to keep them alive. Also, when I saw the children. Um, I would give the children five mark, you know, because I know I would starve. And they were in the currency in Yugoslavia was mark because it was much stronger. Yes. Um, uh, I was in Sarajevo market. James is no word of a lie. There was a man stood there. He was selling a drag of the cigarette for five mark a drag. Yeah, because cigarettes yeah. Was, a, was a very big um, currency. If I saw somebody on the street... Uh, that that would ask us for half a cigarette. I would give him my cigarettes. Yeah. I, I would I would give the, I would give the ladies the, my food. You know my food box for the night. You know when when they used to come and see us uh, around the camps. I used to go ask the lads. Do you need Do you need the food? Do you need the food? You don't need the food because you know, we're going to have food in the morning. I get the boxes together, James, and I would hand them out. I would give them out. Now I that that, that is that, that is my role. That's how I, I hear you. I hear you, and I would hope that in the same circumstances I would be more like you than like Steve. But where do you derive the confidence to condemn him? Because he took a... James, I saw these people. I saw the guy, absolute people. He, he was right. In Tuzla, the husbands were selling their wives, right? But if you start going down that route and taking advantage of that, this is where it goes to pot. We are there to help. We were called the United Nations Protection Force. Yeah to protect the vulnerable and they were vulnerable and if that meant me going out um, without money i would give them money i would give them food and i would feel more happy with myself of course it, 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 but that's it, your personal it, conscience isn't it and it, steve's it conscience is different cry. it's different from yours he's just built differently from you no no it would make me cry jim seeing these people you know smuggling out and actually the look on their face was oh my god what's this man gonna do i saw them have the ham the cheese you know yeah. and the coffee i let them through james because i'm a human being and i know what it's like to you know to want to live and to feed your children you do not have to sell out your body and you do not have to take advantage of these poor people i, I would be like you um but i don't know that we're naive when we think that we could somehow stop the other stuff from happening James, this was James. This was only 400 miles away. This is like I know, people I know. down in Cornwall going to Scotland. Am I going to do that to my fellow people? Like my fellow no, people? you're not. But plenty of other people would. This is not. This is. I mean, he is not an exception. You'll know this better than I do. The the the, the stories of. He is a snake, James. He is a snake. He took advantage. He knew what he was doing. He was going out there for a humanitarian job, and he took advantage of of the situation that he found himself in. He is nothing more than a snake. 
James, I, I'd, I'd take my hat off to you and, and what you did when you were out there. I guess I think that being a snowflake, my, my difficulty now is not, not knowing quite what it would be like to be confronted with the reality you experienced. And because I've never been confronted with that reality, I'm less confident than you are in describing Steve in such um, negative terms. But you are perfectly entitled to because you've walked and where he's walked. Time. The last comment I'm going to take. Take your time, mate. Take all the time you want. James, these people knew, right, and this is what upset me. These people knew what it was like to have Nazi soldiers in their country when I was there in 93. Because you're only talking, what, 39 years ago. Yes. These, pe these people have been, they, they were persecuted under Tito. They were persecuted. Their next door neighbours were killing them. They, they were stealing their property. They were at their lowest ebb. They would do anything. All they wanted, James, was kindness. And I give it to them. Well, thank God you were there. And that man did not. He took advantage. He would dispute that, of course, and say that there were two sides of the coin, the work that he did during the day and then the money that he paid for sex um, after he'd finished what he was well, well, there to do. He, why, did, why didn't he donate that money to the children and to, to the women and not... He could have done both. I, I, I'm not here to defend him, necessarily, but I am here to understand him, and I do, and I won't apologise to I, you I wonder, for that. I wonder, I wonder if he's married and got children, James. I just yeah. wonder that. Well, so do I. I think he said he was single. Certainly at the time he was single, and, and, and that puts a slightly different complexion on things. I, I, yeah. Look, I, James, if it was a team, I'd be on yours. But it doesn't necessarily mean that, that I can deny the existence of the other team, however much I might want to. Simon is in Grimsby. Simon, what would you like to say? Hi, mate. I was um, I was based in Sierra Leone, obviously. Do you know when, obviously, uh, the Diamond yeah. Mines was all the big thing? I was over in Sierra Leone in uh, Kenya back then, and... During the day, you'd obviously see all the kids starving and all the and soldiers get given a pack up with a sandwich and a baguette. And nearly every single squad here used to give all the sausages and the sandwiches and everything else away. Yeah. But then come night time, there used to be the pubs where women had sold the bodies for sex, all locals, obviously, from Sierra Leone. And there was plenty of people who, who, who'd go and sleep with the prostitutes. Did you? But then I was, yeah, I did, yeah. But I, I didn't see I was doing anything wrong. I, mean, I, I don't see what the difference is between... I was watching a documentary this morning. It was about um, a woman in America, a white woman in America, and yeah. couldn't afford her university fees. So she was paying... Uh, she was selling her body for sex. So I really don't see the difference between her selling her body for sex to pay for her university fees and for her living, as opposed to somebody in, in, in a different part of the world doing exactly the same thing. Just a question of what the what what the financial rationale is. So paying for tuition fees or paying because her children are going to starve if she goes home without any money. Do you really see them as morally equivalent? No. But what I'm saying is, just because the the woman in America is pay, is is selling a body for. I, I guess it's a... I'll tell you what it is. No, I hear you. I still think my point stands, but you don't have to answer it. The, the, it's about it's about the width of choice, the breadth of choice, isn't it? I mean, everyone has choice in a sense, but the notion that it's a free choice applies a lot more easily for me to the example you've provided of, of, of the woman seeking help with her tuition fees than it does to the woman who who would perhaps be facing... You know, Sierra Leone, yeah, and Yugoslavia. But you've seen the pictures. People were emaciated. They looked like they'd been rescued from concentration. They were concentration camps in the former Yugoslavia. I'm going to ask you a really gross question, all right? Yugoslavia, so I don't know that. No, all right, but if you, if you had liberated people from a concentration camp and they offered you sex for money, would you have paid them? No, definitely not. Right, why not? Because I watched a documentary this morning and there was a woman on it who was selling sex for help with her tuition fees. What's the difference between that? The diff there was in a pub. The women that was gay... Um, so it's geography. themselves in, in uh, Sierra Leone and Kenya were doing it in a known strip club where, it's, where you can do it, basically. Do you know? So if you're going to a pub that's a strip club and it's well known for, for sexual favours and prostitution... But they are. These, it's a question of how desperate the prostitutes are for your custom, isn't it? And in many ways, if I take your defence to its logical conclusion, then there is no point at which you would say they're too desperate because they're offering. Yeah, if you, nobody's reckoning going to a pub 
and then sell the bodies for sex. So if, if, if you got released from a, from a concentration camp and went to a pub before offering the liberating soldiers your body in return for money, you'd be cool with that? Come off it. Well, I, no, you come off it, because this is, this is where your morals lead. It's not, and I'm not judging you. I'm trying to work out where you put on a break upon this notion of choice and freedom, because there will be a break. There has to be, otherwise you're, you're almost... You're almost subhuman, and you're clearly not. You're clearly a good guy, but you, I'm just pointing out to you that, that, that you're just describing a room to me and calling it a pub or a strip club. There are circumstances in which you would not pay a woman for sex because you felt that she was only offering you sex for money due to her scale or level of desperation. I'm just trying to work out how low you would go. <laughs> That's a bit harsh. It is a bit harsh, but you know how this program works. No, I, I don't think I would have sex with some, some concentration camp victim. So then we go up one stage from that then, do we? And someone whose house has just been destroyed in an earthquake or someone whose family's just been killed as part of a genocidal project in Sierra Leone or Yugoslavia. Do you see what I mean? It's, I mean this is why morals are grey, not black and white. Because there are plenty of circumstances in which you'd think it was disgusting, just not the circumstances you've been in. But what I'm saying is, if you get time off work during night times and you go to the local bars and there's women selling assaults for sex, yeah. what is the biggest problem in, in paying for that? Well, their desperation, but we've been around this. that be in Kenya, in Sierra Leone, in America, in England? Yeah, the, well, we've, we've, all, we've done this, mate. We've danced this tune already. The, the answer is their level of desperation, and you've acknowledged yourself that there is a level of desperation which would prevent you from going down that path. I'm just trying to work out exactly where it is. So women in Sierra Leone, whether they're in a bar or on a street corner or uh, wherever they are, they have endured as you know a lot better than I do, you were there. Circumstances that are beyond the ken of most Westerners. We can't begin to imagine what it would be like to, to, to be a victim of that kind of warfare, to be caught up in that kind of crossfire. And you're cool with paying them for sex? After everything had calmed down, yeah. Obviously, I won't... I do. I admire your honesty, and I'd be I'd, I'd I'd be lost without it, without you and without Steve. But you you can't. I can't let you go away without acknowledging two things. I have to acknowledge how easy it is to take the moral high ground from the comfort of a studio. Okay, and I'll do that. And, I, and if that involves an apology, I make the apology. But you have to acknowledge that actually it's not black and white. There are circumstances in which you'd think, do you know what? Her situation is so dire, her situation is so desperate that even though she's swearing blind she really, really wants to do this in return for my money, I'm not going to do that because her situation is so desperate. You acknowledge that, right? Yeah, I, I'll give you that one. Yeah, and I will. I will give myself a bit of. I was only eighteen when I was over in Sierra Leone. Yeah, and, and that's why I'm so not judging I will you. Give myself a bit of leeway. However, if if I went over there now, I'd, I'd have a completely different spin on it. I'm 37 years old and, mm. and look at life completely different to an 18 year old kid who's just full of testosterone. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. And I but thank yeah, you. I do take your point for. Well, that's it. I mean, that, that, is, that is where... Good grief. I mean, that is the conversation in a nutshell. Thank you so much, Simon. I, 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 I apologise for uh, pulling out the big guns, but I knew you'd be able to deal with it. Because that is the point, isn't it? Is that we all have a moral compass. It's just always interesting to see how many different directions they point in. 11.38 is the time. Good grief. I, I, so people often have slightly snobbish views of radio phone-ins. Um, I, I like to think that this one is, is slowly demolishing all of those views. And I, I can't remember a more complicated or challenging conversation than the one we had for the, for the last 90 minutes. If you missed it, we'll put up some of the um, most compelling contributions, as we always do. I am